working on it. <laughs> Recording us wondering what we're doing. Yeah. We can, we can edit out that part. We can just pause the recording too. I don't, if any, if Suzanne, actually, you might be able to see that pause button at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's a two lines. Yeah, it's not coming up. No, there it is. Okay, it just came up. That you want. I'm Rachel Whirling. I'm the coordinator for the program. And hopefully you got my email in the announcement. So I'm just going to introduce Suzanne, Suzanne Willow, and she's part of uh, the Willow Wit program with Lanita and they have a wonderful place. This is a picture that you're seeing up there on Grizzly Peak that they do all kinds of education with and um, have been involved in the community in lots of different ways. And I'm sure she's going to talk about it a little bit more. But this is about the specific green burial program that they now have going on. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Suzanne. Hi, I'm Suzanne Willow. Um, and uh, this is an overview of our land. Uh, I have a land acknowledgement that I would love to give. And I just wanted to give you a little uh, heads up. We're looking south toward Shasta there and Pilot Rock. And uh, Mount Ashland is uh, to our right. And our uh, property is uh, this meadow, which is all wet wetlands, uh, wet meadows and wetlands, and then uh, surrounded by about uh, 280 acres of mostly conifer forests. Um, so uh, next slide, please. She's advancing them for me. Um, all lands are tribal lands, and we live on tribal lands. Um, Willowit Ranch is located on the upland to Kelma, Lutgawa, Athapaskan, and Shasta indigenous lands. We have evidence uh, here of people being here at least 8,000 years. At the end of the Rogue River Wars in 1856, uh, these people and many others were from Western Oregon were forcibly removed to the Siletz Reservation and the Grand Ronde Reservation. Today, many people of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde community in Oregon are living descendants of the peoples from this land. These indigenous communities are the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We want to acknowledge that this land was not given to us, but was taken from others. Uh, physically, uh, we are, if you're driving down I-5, looking to the left, Grizzly Peak is the highest peak you're gonna see, and we're directly on the back of it. Um, and uh, we, our land is an inholding in the Cascade Siskiyou National Monument expansion, the new area uh, that was expanded. We have 445 acres and um, the crest uh, is what uh, we refer to as the rock outcropping that you see in the upper left photo. That's actually a volcanic, uh, we're part of the same volcano that made Grizzly Peak. And uh, Grizzly Peak is the highest part of Grizzly Mountain that's left. And we have this little rock outcropping over here. It's actually at uh, 55, 5,600 feet. And uh, that's the crest of the mountain. And uh, the water on our land flows to the Bear Creek. The water directly over that, that uh, just on our land, just over that crest flows into Butte uh, Creek. And then from the east side of our property, the, land, the water flows into Klamath uh, uh, watershed. Uh, we've had an archeologist working with us and we've worked with the uh, Confederated Tribes of the uh, Grand Ronde. And um, this is a picture of an exquisite uh, uh, camas, uh, Camasia Quamash. And it uh, is a native flower here, but it is also uh, the first cultivated plant on this land. Uh, the uh, first peoples would find a place that Camas grew and then would cultivate it. We have large, not quite circular, but large swaths of uh, Camas that comes up every year. And the root of the Camas, the bulb of the Camas uh, was a main source of um, carbohydrate for winter. So geology, Grizzly Mountain exploded, you know, 22 million years ago. And I had a, a uh, kindergartner ask me if I was here um, 
And so Grizzly Peak is the, the biggest piece. Um, we have a valley right behind that. And then this crest uh, that you're looking at, the second one is looking down short Shasta that's in a, in a cloud at that time. So the geology of that makes um, uh, a, uh, a thin soil um, and uh, a lot of rocks, lots and lots of rocks, of course. It happens that this particular valley is ringed by about 12 springs that come through uh, the volcanic rock where the uh, impervious rock meets uh, uh, the, the uh, openings, uh, we have springs come up. So we have quite a bit of water, which is what makes the wet wetlands and also um, makes the wet meadows. Uh, soil, where we have good soil, we have beautiful loam. It's only about a foot deep. This is not the Applegate Valley by any means. Uh, much of this is uh, very thin soil, uh, not great for, uh, for growing a lot of plants. Uh, grows trees beautifully, just really, really slowly. So we have uh, trees that are, you know, a, a foot in diameter that are 80 years old, 100 years old. So that's about the land. And then what about the people the uh, uh, government has done with this? Zoning, this land is zoned. It's uh, 445 acres. Uh, it's zoned Forest Reserve 160. So we couldn't, uh, we can sell, uh, a we could have sold a piece, we can't, but um, you couldn't build a house on anything less than 160. And when we got here in 1984, we could not have built a house if there hadn't been an old house here. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, who are we? Um, I'm the one with the darker hair and my wife, Lenita Witt, is the one with the white hair. And the goats uh, in front of me are Harvey Milk and uh, next to Lenita are, is Barney. Um, so, um, well, our daughter was 10 when we found this land. She grew up here, she's off and away. Um, we found it under four feet of snow, uh, December 31st, 1984. And um, today it looks very much like the lower left corner. So we had about four feet of snow, which is the best December snow we've had in probably 10 years. And uh, it's down to about two feet as in that, that photo. Uh, the right photo is what we look like uh, in the early summer. Uh, the little house and the big barn there um, were built in about 1920, we added on. Uh, we're completely off grid. Uh, there's no uh, grid electricity here at all. And um, the uh, uh, water comes from one of the artesian springs, one of these 12 springs uh, that we've piped over. So, uh, I'm kind of moving along here. I forgot to say under zoning, uh, when we were told that uh, we, we were given the wrong zoning. And so when we watch out when you buy land, um, we were told that uh, the zoning was forest, was farm, which it is not. Um, but uh, in the uh, forest uh, 160 back in 1985, um, we were basically told uh, we couldn't have had a home if we didn't have one there. We could, uh, the conditional uses that we could have, uh, including growing trees and cutting trees, uh, would be a campground, a school, a church, a prison, or a cemetery. So a very interesting arrangement of uh, uh, conditional uses. That's expanded quite a bit now. We could do a lot of other extractive, uh, extractive uh, minerals and stuff at this point, but we're not gonna do that either. And we're not gonna make the prison. We do have the campground. This is the church and this is the school, of course. And we now have a cemetery. So let's do the next slide. Thank you. Okay. So what do we do on our land? Um, we have a diversified certified uh, organic farm. We basically certified, we did certify the entire property because our goats go out and eat in the forest all the time. Uh, and we wanted to raise certified organic goats. Um, cows had been 
left to graze on these land, this land, uh, some in the forest, but unfortunately, mostly in those wet meadows and wetlands. And so there was a lot of erosion and that was about 150 years until we kept working on fences, but it wasn't working much. We're surrounded by Bureau of Land Management and there are a number of grazes, uh, grazing leases around us. So we have um, finally got up a very, very good uh, high tensile fence and um, got all the cows off the land and they really do stay off um, as long as we close the gate. So we've been restoring wetlands and um, um, the uh, lower right picture here uh, are some kids in our first uh, willow planting. We've planted about, oh, probably 16,000 willows at this point. And then um, um, we also have, I'm uh, sorry, I just lost my place. Um, we just lost the, uh, the sharing, the, sh lost the screen. But um, the other thing we do is that grow vegetables, but we don't have uh, that thin soil. And of course, being at 5,000 feet, we have a lot of cold. And uh, usually our last uh, winter frost is by the middle of July and our first next winter frost comes late August. So we grow everything under row covers, under these polyester row covers, and we have a, a high tunnel, an unheated high tunnel. Um, we don't wanna spend a lot of uh, the world's energies uh, heating places. So we really use solar. And of course we use it for our, uh, as our uh, electricity too. Um, we have about four acres uh, that we use that we've taken out of the wetland restoration. 76 acres is in wetland restoration. Uh, a grazing exclusion lease uh, with the USDA uh, Farm Services Agency, uh, Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, and we just signed another 30-year lease. And um, uh, that just means that we can't have any grazing animals whatsoever. We can walk in it, we can plant, we can do a lot. We do most of our education within the wetlands. And um, we, uh, the other farm, farm things we do are, we have a small uh, dairy herd and we have a herd share, uh, sell milk through a herd share and on farm. We sell eggs and uh, we sell eggs through uh, the herd share. We sell them on farm and we have agritourism. So that has been one of the ways that we've been able to stay on the land. This is the meadow house upper right. It's a three bedroom, two bath house. That's a, a licensed traveler's accommodation. And the left is one of the furnished wall tents at our campground. And our campground uh, we use for um, uh, individuals to come and rent either the wall tents or bring their own tent. We have a uh, fully stocked big cookhouse and a uh, great bathhouse. Um, we have uh, the bathhouse is wheelchair accessible as is the cookhouse and we're redoing all our paths to become wheelchair accessible. So by next July, hopefully everything except these few, uh, there are four of these wall tents that are on the platforms. Those won't be wheelchair accessible, but we'll have another 10 that are. So we can do programs for kids and get all the kids out uh, uh, into outdoor education. So we're really excited about that. And we do um, the outdoor education through the Crest, which is a nonprofit. We started in 2007. And um, the, uh, the Crest has uh, programs both uh, within the school year um, we have enough snow that we don't bring kids up here in the uh, winter, of course, middle of the winter, but we have um, outdoor school program for fifth and sixth graders starting in May and until um, school ends. And then we start again in September until probably the end of October, if we can swing it with uh, not too much snow. And um, then in the summer, we have summer programs and most of those are day camps and we were able to get a uh, grant from the Oregon Community Foundation last year and bust 
children in uh, the, the kids who have lost their homes in Talent and Phoenix. Um, many of them are still living in, um, out at the expo in small uh, RVs. And so we were able to bus them up here. We also stopped in Talent and stopped in Ashland and um, uh, had 10 full weeks um, of uh, a uh, full day started at nine and ended at 3.30, um, outdoor fun and education. And it was just a wonderful thing. Uh, the Oregon Community Foundation also gave us scholarship money. So I think 53% of the kids uh, had some scholarship money. And we also uh, were able to uh, give them a bag of vegetables and a uh, box of eggs to take home to their families twice a week. And the kids got to choose, they got to shop for the, uh, the vegetables. They got to choose which ones they wanted. And uh, so if their brother liked a lot of that chard, they can get extra chard the second time. So uh, it was a wonderful program and we're going to expand that to even more kids um, this next year. So Healthy Forest, um, we met Marty Main in 1987. Uh, he surveyed our forests and sat us at the kitchen table and said, you ladies have a mighty sick forest here. So one of the things that we've done with Marty over the years, still very, very friendly with him, of course, and we work with him and take his advice, but we ask what the possibilities are. We had this huge overgrowth of uh, white fur. What could we do? Could we, do we just take it all down? Um, do we try to make as much money? What's gonna be best for the land? And so we've pretty much decided with any forestry operations, we've really looked at what's the best thing we could do for the land. And so we have improved our forests tremendously. Of course, they're not as overstocked. We've really looked to um, decrease um, fuels, to uh, decrease fire danger. You can't get rid of fire danger. And, um, then uh, we've used, uh, actually used the same logger for the past 25 years now. And uh, we use low impact logging, very, very selective cuts um, about every five to 10 years. So this is not a, a money-making business. And um, our forest has now uh, gone from an over, overstocked sick white fur forest to a multi-species uneven aged aging forest. So the size of our trees have become remarkably bigger and a lot more space around them and they're growing faster. Let's do the next slide. Oh, I wanted to say first, a natural burial cemetery is the other thing we're doing. So here it is. Um, we have uh, 18 acres currently um, licensed as the forest conservation burial ground. Um, this is the first new, brand new um, cemetery in Oregon in we believe about 50 years, but there's nobody in the state who can say when the last one was licensed. So um, we are specifically a green or natural burial cemetery. So um, we do not uh, uh, take any embalmed um, bodies. Um, we ask that people be dressed in organic, in, excuse me, in natural fibers. You don't have to have organic cloth. And um, a lumber, number, most people are buried in shrouds. As you see, um, the shroud in the middle is a, a sheet. The shroud on the right, uh, her friends crocheted her a shroud. Um, and, and then basically plain wooden caskets as on the left. Um, we don't use any vaults or grave liners. Uh, we don't have any lawn uh, in which to, that we need to um, mow over any of the, uh, uh, the burials. Um, and the point is that we are working with the earth to return to the earth. And we do firmly believe that we are part of the earth. Um, and we're returning to the earth and um, decomposing in the way uh, that uh, works without any chemicals. So let's do the next slide.
we're expanding the cemetery to uh, 37 acres totally. One of the uh, nice things about green burials is um, a lot of family participation. And uh, we certainly have family. You can see the people um, uh, in the middle and the lower slide are uh, putting soil uh, into the graves. So if the family wants to stay and can stay, family and friends, um, they can completely cover the grave. And at the base of the grave, as you'll see later, um, we put um, uh, boughs, uh, just fresh cut boughs, uh, which make lowering the body a little less noisy. Um, there is a sound when you, even if you're slowly lowering uh, a body in it, there is some thud at the bottom. And uh, so this lowers it, but it also allows more oxygen in and allows that decomposition to start. And then we lower the body in um, and then put more boughs over again for air and then uh, refill the grave. We dig the graves by hand at this point and um, we dig them in the strata uh, of the soil and that's really important. I don't know if you can see much on the top grave, the large soil, the large pile there is mostly clay and rocks because this is an old volcano. Um, the right in the middle above the grave uh, is actually topsoil. That's that's where the plants are. And then the next one to the left at the base of that little uh, little tree is um, the forest soil. So uh, rocks and, and clay at the bottom, of course. And then there's a beautiful six inch to a foot uh, forest loam and then the actual topsoil that has plants. And we return the soil in those strata. So when the soil goes back in, uh, the uh, animals and uh, bacteria within the soil are back close to where they had been and uh, uh, continue their biological activity. Um, this really helps us feel that the uh, us being humans, not us specifically, uh, feel that we are working with um, the forest, uh, literally the forest, to um, be able to put quite a bit of carbon in and um, be able to let that decompose in a very natural way. Um, let's go to the next slide. We've had 11 burials so far, and uh, uh, we also accept, uh, we bury cremated remains, and we also scatter cremated remains. We also have a pet cemetery, which does not have to be licensed. So green burial is a little different from the, quote, standard, which is now called lawn uh, burial. And, um, the standard, you know, six feet under, um, you don't have to be six feet under. And the um, soil below about a four foot depth actually uh, has less moisture and less, um, uh, less life to be able to work with the decomposition. So we want to stay in that three to four foot um, area. Um, uh, the other thing that, that you can do with uh, green burial is that shallow burial, less than four feet, optimizes land that would be unusable if you have um, rock below that, which of course we do, the rock gets bigger as we go down in the old volcano. Um, and uh, uh, you can use areas that really have fairly shallow soil quite well. Um, there is no soil or water contamination reported in or near green, beds, green cemeteries, and that's been studied quite a bit. Most of the contamination um, around lawn cemeteries is actually from the embalming fluids. So uh, it's not from uh, the decomposition of bodies, it's actually from uh, the chemicals that are used for embalming. 
Um, and if there is an 18 inch uh, cover above the body, um, there have been no, no uh, animal disturbances at all. And that's been studied. Of course, we all used to be buried in quote, green burials because that was how we were all buried uh, before um, modern funeral sciences came in. So let's go to the, to the next slide. Uh, someone had asked if I'm going to talk about, um, quote, composting, uh, which is uh, its uh, official name is natural organic reduction. I would call that a euphemism, but it's composting. Um, and the other um, newer non-heat uh, cremation is called water cremation, which is actually uh, alkaline hydrolysis. It's not water. Um, it's a liquid uh, that breaks down the body. And then another liquid, uh, it's a, a very alkaline um, solution. And I'm afraid I don't know how long it takes. Um, and then the, that's it on the left. Uh, and then uh, that uh, alkaline uh, fluid is neutralized um, and it's either put into a sewer or it could be used as um, fertilizer, I'm told, uh, that there's some place in Colorado that uses it on a flower farm. So um, I don't know any, any more about that, basically. Uh, on the right is a, basically a homemade um, composter. Um, and so uh, there are two, um, this is one place in Washington. There's another one that's near Seattle um, that uh, use wood chips. You'll see the wood chips there, plus or minus uh, some alfalfa the body, of course, uh, and then um, some microbes and steam. So this is held, uh, the body is held and rotated at a uh, set um, temperature with um, constant steam. Um, and I'm afraid I don't know how long that takes either. Um, because of the other materials besides the body that are put in there, um, it produces a full cubic yard of compost. And if you have a standard size, say, you know, Tundra or Ford pickup, that's a half cubic yard. So it's two of those. Um, and uh, so it's, it, it has some, this is a compost that is probably not supposed to be used on uh, uh, your food. Um, I guarantee that there's not going to be uh, any uh, you know, hepatitis B, any uh, um, human E. coli that's going to be a problem coming out of that. Um, Oregon has just uh, passed, Pam Marsh uh, uh, sponsored uh, that Oregon has just okayed natural organic reduction. There are no, <clears throat> excuse me, no businesses doing that in Oregon at this point. Let's go to the next slide. I'm watching the time here. So the advantage of natural burial is um, that it uses land that um, sometimes otherwise would not be used, but um, because it's not, uh, the land is not put to a different purpose, it's simply replaced uh, in the layers from which it came, the soil, um, recreation, agriculture, and education can still go on above, uh, above the soil and then natural burial below. And I do want to say that our land has a 5k uh, trail, the uh, running trail that runs all the way through it, and it runs through the cemetery. And we also do some of our forest education for kids in the cemetery. So there really is that mixing that sense that uh, we all are part of the land and um, whether we are on top of the land studying it, whether we're being uh, carefully held in soil and decomposed, um, we're all in the same space and life and death really are that circle that go around. So let's do the next slide.
So longevity, I wanted to throw this in because we, it took us until 2020 in order to decide and make a cemetery. But we've been here since 1984. That's what that little house and barn looked like when we first saw it. The first time we saw it without snow, which was about five months after we got it. So it's, um, if you have the ability to live on land quite a while, quite a while, and whether that's you know ten years or in our case thirty-seven now, um, it's an absolute privilege. And one of the things that uh, that's probably the most important part is uh, that gradual revelation of what the land has, what the land offers, what the land needs, what will help the land, what doesn't. We've made some mistakes. We've put fences and, and then the water runs down and suddenly you have a brand new erosion. It's like, oh no, have to go back and fix what we've, uh, what we've created. So we have a number of evidences, especially with cows, but a number of uh, places on our land that we can see that uh, humans, um, European Americans have, uh, not done so well by the land. And then we've had to go, be, including our own, our own uh, mistakes. And then having to go back and try to fix uh, what, we've, uh, what we've eroded. And uh, we do a lot of uh, planting with willows in the uh, native willows in the wetlands, of course. Uh, we also, uh, if we have any area that, um, is starting to pool water that is not in an area that it should, that we're going to be getting erosion. We'll put uh, either wood chips or um, bark in it. We use big woody debris in bigger areas in, uh, that have eroded. Um, so conservation of land is not something that uh, you're going to know about in the first you know, number of years you're there, two or three years you're there, you won't really know how do you work toward conservation unless you have some, uh, um, you will, I'll do that in a minute, yep. Um, unless you have some, uh, some huge, you know, if you walk into a place and you say, uh-oh, we've really got to fix this before it goes any further, something like that. So my feeling is that most of the things that you find that you really want to make a choice um, between uh, cutting or leaving a tree, cutting or leaving a particular type of tree. Um, you're going to find those over a number of years, not, not in that first looking at it. Um, so that comes up to legacy planning. And I think that um, legacy planning, a lot of us, um, I was actually in a class with uh, Pat Gordon, uh, who was the person who suggested that you know, even though Linda and I were going to be buried on the land, uh, Pat said, you know, you, 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 you're in the right zoning. You could just, uh, you could make a cemetery. So um, I'll probably get into that in the comments and questions afterward. But, um, but talking about what do you do, especially if you have forest land, what do you do with that um, when we're dying? You know, as we leave, um, do our kids want to keep it? Do our kids want to uh, sell it? Um, is it going to be sold for development? Uh, if you have an area uh, like ours that that is zoned, so it's not going to have a lot of development, but also um, uh, is pretty. Uh, friable land as far as um, the, the soil is so thin that it doesn't take much of a rivulet to uh, start eroding off uh, the soil and then the grasses go. So we're kind of watching that all the time. So evaluating the land that you have um, to look at what, uh, what does it need for conservation. Um, we're doing a stewardship trust, which is a, a new Thing in Oregon, it's uh, basically um, a trust that um, 
leaves uh, either, but leaves a business and our business, Willow Whit Ranch, including our cemetery, of course, um, is going to um, be held in a trust that actually will own the land. And um, it's not in a trust for any person, it's in trust for the land and the business will keep um, conserving the land and um, contributing to the nonprofit and uh, outdoor education. So um, that's kind of the end. I'm gonna, because we started so late, I'm rushing through this quite a bit. And I know there are gonna be more questions about the cemetery, um, but um, let's go to the next slide. It's, Suzanne, it's not advancing. Yes. Oh, okay. I don't know that I can. I don't, there's nothing, I don't, yeah. Nothing I can do here, I think. I'm, I'm back here, so, okay, she's got it. There we go, okay. Okay, so these are critical questions that, that we have asked and keep asking, and we did not know to ask when we first got here. We had no idea. We just fell in love with this land and said, oh, it's great, let's buy it. We didn't have any idea. I, we literally bought it under four feet of snow and had never seen the soil except under the house. So we, we didn't do any of the things that I would suggest you do, like wondering if there's water and finding your actual zoning. Um, so these are questions that I think any of us who own probably even a house uh, and you know in a neighborhood need to ask, but um, how do I identify my land? Um, I just happen to love this picture of the Milky Way. Um, and what makes sense on this land? And then coming around to zoning, of course, what can I do with my land and what can't I do with my land? Number of things we can't do. Um, how will I care for my land? And what's my legacy for this land? Um, our legacy basically is uh, leaving a business that we plan to have uh, enduring so it can continue the conservation of this uh, this piece of land. I think the next may be the last slide too. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So come for a visit or come for a stay. Um, we, um, we have an open farm. So the farm and the far ranch and the farm store are open to the public daily, 11 to five every day. Um, we, uh, the forest conservation burial ground is open dawn to dusk every day. Um, it is right inside the gate. As you come up to Willow Whit Ranch, if you park just inside the gate, there's a parking area, or you can park just outside the gate. The BLM has a big wide parking area there too. Um, feel free to walk around the around the cemetery. It is a beautiful, a beautiful piece of land, and it's a very sweet space to be in. Um, you can take a, a self-guided farm tour. Um, we do organized farm tours by um, reservation, and we charge for them. Uh, goat walks. We raise uh, go uh, goats for dairy, but um, they have boys and we raise the boys for backpacking. And those were the backpacking goats you saw with uh, Lenita and me. Um, we sell them to other people at this point. We're not, not able to continue backpacking right now. So we have goat walks here instead of goat backpacking. They used to jump in the truck and we'd all go together. Right now we're doing snowshoeing, which is gorgeous. We still have about two feet of snow. It's just wonderful. Uh, skiing, it's pretty icy right now, but it's just gorgeous. Camping, of course, in our campground, hiking, um, birding. We're a birding hotspot. I think, I believe to uh, be designated as a hotspot, you have to see 15 species in an hour. You can see that in 15 minutes here. Uh, the combination of um, 
uh, conifers and oak woodlands and of course all the uh, all the wetlands and wet meadows are a uh, uh, big attractant for birds. Um, picnicking, bring a picnic and come up and go out into one of the meadows and have a picnic. Um, our five, 5k trail run, uh, it's called the turtle trot um, and um, I'll tell you about the turtles. Um, and we are di almost directly across from the turn off to the, uh, the trailhead for Grizzly Peak. So a lot of people climb Grizzly Peak and then come to the ranch. Um, our 5K run is called the Turtle Trot because our little pond, once we started restoring the wetlands and our water table started rising, little uh, uh, Western pond turtles came up to the, our little pond, which is less than a quarter acre. It's this tiny little pond. And um, it's a man-made, a person-made pond in probably the 1970s. A 15-year-old was told to get on that, that uh, big cat over there and go over to that wet spot and dig a hole and make a pond. So if you can believe that, it's still standing. Um, and uh, we did, we deepened it. So we use it for uh, the uh, Oregon Department of Forestry uses it for helicopters, uh, which has been a, a blessing because we've had some fires around us. So uh, our pond is now home to the highest elevation breeding population of Western pond turtles, I would say in the world, but it's basically in all of uh, Oregon. The Western pond turtle only has a world that goes to Baja and to uh, Washington. It's a, a fairly limited in the uh, space in the world. But um, they normally don't breathe below, excuse me, above 3,500 feet. This pond is at 4,850. And we have more than 100 marked turtles in there. And they can't be marked until they're 8 to 10 years old because their shell isn't firm enough. And we find these gorgeous little quarter size babies um, coming, walking to the pond um, when they're about a year old. They stay in the nest for the first year and then they walk into the pond. Um, we have a study blind that we uh, uh, got a uh, grant uh, to put up and we have uh, uh, binoculars for all our kids. So we spend a lot of time around the pond and a lot of time um, working with the turtles, not working with the turtles, watching the turtles. And then uh, Michael Parker from SOU is a herpetologist and he spends time with the turtles. He comes up a couple of times a year with classes and uh, trap turtles and we uh, have progressive weights and sizes on all the ones that we've marked before. And uh, so we know that because our water is so cold from this artesian spring, uh, they, grow they grow smaller uh, than they normally would. Um, but uh, very healthy breeding population. And we have a couple that are well over 50 or 60 years old. So that's our turtles. Um, you can come up for a farm stay in the meadow house, furnished wall tents, bring your own tent and um, contact us um, by email and uh, willowitranch.com is our website. We have a reservation system on there uh, that you can see real time what's available. Um, we also host weddings and family reunions. So I think I'm going to stop there because there are probably going to be a lot more questions because we kind of got started so late. I ran through this. Okay, I think, um, Marcy, I think everyone's had a chance to see that slide so you can stop your screen share. So thank you, Suzanne. That's really quite interesting. Um, we have one question. I, I know I have a number. If anybody else has other questions, um, it's really an interesting thing to think about. So um, Steve asks, he says, please discuss the regulatory hurdles and costs associated with setting up cemetery, the cemetery. And what about long-term issues, public access, deed restrictions, is it kept in perpetuity? All of the above. <laughs> um, you know, I have to say uh, the development, because our zoning uh, allows this as a 
uh, conditional use. Of course, we had to get a conditional use permit for $1,700 through the county, but um, they, they're going to say yes. There's not a question as to whether or not they uh, would allow that because it is a conditional use in that zoning. Um, so with the correct zoning, it was reasonably easy. Um, we had a, a few, most of the hurdles were um, going through the Oregon Mortuary and Cemetery Board and um, no one there has ever opened, has ever licensed a brand new cemetery, of course, because nobody's worked there for, you know, 50 years. And so um, they hadn't, uh, uh, we, there, there are a lot of laws, of course, and a lot of rules, um, but um, there's not a lot of experience for people to say, well, you have to put money here and you have to uh, put deposits there. So uh, there are a number of state agencies that you need to deal with the uh, Department of Consumer and Business Services. Um, we give them a report every year, but it's been so long since anybody started a new cemetery, they didn't have an application. Uh, you only, they only had a form for annual reports. So I made an <laughs> annual report as if, as if we had been there last year. She said, that's a good idea. So it's really interesting, that, that kind of stuff. Uh, the county, because of our zoning, um, uh, it was fairly straightforward. You know, everything takes a number of months. Um, of course, um, uh, deed restriction, absolutely. A cemetery is a cemetery is a cemetery forever. Uh, people do not have to keep burying people. They don't have to keep selling plots, um, but it is always a cemetery. And so there's nothing else that could ever be done on that. So a deed restriction, absolutely. And um, it becomes a subdivision when you enter your um, survey into the into the state survey it becomes subdivided even though it's not a like a lot split it's a subdivision within, so does that uh, if i could interject does that affect your whole 400 acres or is it just applied to did you say it was the five acre acres for the cemetery uh 37 37 oh, thir acres okay, and 37. it's just the 37 acres yeah it's a deed restriction on okay. that 37 acres yeah so whatever we could do on our other places, by other places on the land, we can still do. Yeah. Okay. So we have uh, another we have another question in the chat box. Yeah. How much do the plots cost? Uh, the plots, uh, the standard plot is three thousand six hundred dollars, and um, uh, we have all of this on our website, which I did not put on there. Is the forest conservation burial dot org. I'll find that um, and put that in the chat. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Yes, it ended up being long. Uh, you know, going for domain names, um, uh, you have to find something that nobody else has. So that's what right. we have. Uh, so the forest conservation burial.org. And um, so 3,600 for a basic plot for the plot. Uh, there is an area that we're calling Vista that is uh, uh, closer in. We're, we're selling four and a half acres. Uh, we're selling burial plots in four and a half acres at this point. Out of this 1800 that's licensed right now, we have the application in to expand to 37 acres. Uh, it's in the county and sitting on somebody's desk. Um, and so um, uh, 3,600 for the plot, the opening and closing, which is the digging of the grave, the burial, the process, the, uh, the, the whole, uh, um, ceremony um, is $1,800. And then there's a $150 recording fee because all of the paperwork has to be recorded with the state. And um, people can uh, use a funeral home and all the funeral homes know to come up here. And uh, of course, have to have four wheel drive this time of the year. And then um, people can also do a home funeral and keep their loved one at home. And that's totally legal. There's a lot of information on the web about that. And then um, people can bring a loved one up in the back of their car. We've had a few people come up in the back of the car or in the back of the truck. Other questions? 
I was just looking up, seeing if I could find a, an easy resource for home funeral. I, um, okay, Christina says, perhaps you said, but how many people are you able to serve in your cemetery? Um, we have plots that are five feet by 10 feet. And we are, of course, out of that 37 acres, we're not going to, we have a grid that covers everything. So everything is a potential five by 10 plot. Um, you know, there are streams, there are trees, there are rocks, there's a huge, gorgeous ravine. Um, so if we had a burial in each one of those plots, we would have 33,000 and something. We would, um, I'll be one of them. I will be, I will be one, of, one of them before, long before it, uh, um, before it uh, gets there, uh, to that point. But, um, so probably I would estimate in the you know, 30,000 or something like that. And cemeteries usually are planned for 100 to 200 years minimum. And so it's assumed that um, this is going to be used as an active burial ground. And then probably after that, um, still as an area for scattering cremated remains and also for burying cremated remains because they can be put right in the soil without having to dig down to the three to four feet. <laughs> Christina says, I think that's enough. Is that, I think that's enough. <laughs> when, I, when I give tours, people have said, do I need to buy now? It's like, no, we can, we got plenty of space. <laughs> right. Plenty. Um, Steve asks, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. And that's so interesting that, you know, the cemeteries that are in place are the ones that have been in place. Um, I mean, you know, yeah. our history isn't actually, I mean, in terms of Western culture, it's not that long that we've been here, really. I think the Rogue Valley was, I think gold was discovered in 1852. So that's not that long ago, really, in terms of lifetimes, yeah. Um, yeah. in terms of white people being buried here. Um, yeah. yeah. Or Western people. Um, yeah. So uh, Steve says, uh, what could you explain a little bit more about the recording fee and say who does the digging? I, I'm not sure what's um, behind that or if a family member could do that. Um, we, does anybody here our insurance agent? <laughs> um, we have, um, we, we, have a, a far, a, we have a farm staff. We have these wonderful, happens to be four men right now who work with us on the farm and they kind of do everything around the farm. They do everything around the land. They do landscaping and they dig graves uh, and they also help bury people. And of course, that's something we ask everyone if they wanted to do. It's not something that you take one job and suddenly you're told to do another one. Um, and um, they all happen to be young men 40 or less and 40 or younger. And uh, they all have felt that it was, um, that it's an amazing honor to be involved in burying someone. Um, so that's who digs the hole. Um, we have started renting an electric jackhammer and taking a generator out. Uh, we were literally digging much larger holes to get out. We have boulders, of course, you know, Mm, desk size boulders. So um, we were having to simply move the move the uh, move the grave over a little bit to the side. So uh, now we're renting a, a jackhammer if we come up against a a, a big boulder. Um, and the other question was, who digs the grave? And oh, the recording. Who digs so? um, there's yeah. there's a, in order to in order to bury uh, anyone, uh, even in your in your backyard and you can be buried on your own land if you don't live within city limits. You can actually get a permit to be buried on your own land. You have to uh, annotate your deed that you know grandma's buried in the backyard. So it, all, it has to be a piece of information that always goes with that deed, but it's not a deed restriction. Um, so uh, there is a uh, fee that um, has to be recorded. Uh, there's a piece of paper that um, comes from the public health department actually, um, and uh, is a, it's considered a transit permit, but uh, it is 
uh, started with the death certificate and then uh, the transit permit allows someone to move the body to a funeral home, to a burial, and then that transit permit uh, also we record the burial on it, then we have to record that with the state. And so it's a, there's, um, there's a lot of paperwork. Yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's something we all get the pleasure of experiencing or not really being there. Well, I mean, with family members, I guess yeah. we experience it, but yeah. you know, and it is one of those things that is a part of human life. So, um, but, and it's, always amazing to me how we kind of don't know about it just like giving birth or other things I mean I and and if we yeah. think of how how natural it used to be I have some friends who, who and a friend really who passed away uh, she was their mother and they did a, a natural funeral and then they had a cremation but that was the first time that I had experienced that and it and I know it's really something that people are doing more and um, I think it's really a, a perspective shift for a lot of us but something yeah. that seems yeah. like it should be a possibility for sure. Um, yeah. Christina says, um, so in X number of years, can the plots be replanted? Not in the United States. Uh, in Austria, interestingly enough, um, 26 years is what you get in a grave. I'm looking at a picture of Christina here. Uh, you get 26 years in a grave and then the body is exhumed. The bones are exhumed, put in an ossuary and then another family to use that grave for 26 years. Um, it's apparently a lot of places in the world, it's somewhere between 25 and 70 years, um, the graves can be reused, but they're, they're not in the United States. That's, um, there is no legal place to do that in the United States. And someone so, asks, can you plant a tree on top of your grave? No. <laughs> um, the, the reason being that um, this particular area of the forest, I think I turned off my... There you are. You're back now. Um, this particular, yeah, this particular piece of forest. Um, and then we're the, the meadow adjoining it is actually was a wetland. Um, 20 years ago and within the last 10 years has become dryland plants, about 80% of it. So it is a drying wet meadow that is no longer, it has a, a little tiny stream rivulet down the middle now and it used to be a wet meadow when we first got here. So, um, so climate change is um, amazingly obvious in a few of these places. So the answer about a tree is no, um, uh, this particular piece of the forest, we've actually had to thin out quite a few trees. It was quite overgrown. And um, we've made the trees um, healthier and the forest healthier um, by thinning out. So uh, of course we wouldn't plant trees in a meadow either because that's a totally different ecosystem. So um, you can plant a tree someplace else in, in honor of someone, something, someplace that does need afforestation. Uh, this forest is actually over, overly um, uh, forested, if anything, and uh, still needs quite a bit of thinning. And uh, but there are trees out. all around there, so there are trees with you. you. But go ahead, I like Colette. the idea no of becoming a tree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you will become a tree here. Yeah, you will become a tree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it may not be from here. It could be from here and here. Or here from here. here. <laughs> you will. You, you will become a tree here. Absolutely. Yes. Good. Yes. So uh, we will all design trees. Bobby and Pat Allaire, who took our master uh, naturalist course down here. And we did, we went, I think we went up to Willow Witt with that course. I know we did in one. I'm not sure if that was the one that they were in, but uh, she, they ask. How far away from your location did yeah. the people who are currently buried come from? How far away what? How far away did people come from? Are these just locals or are people coming from far away? Have they heard about this possibility? Uh, a ways. So our very first burial, um, an interesting story is a man who uh, was in Florida, uh, lived on a, uh, 
lived on a boat with his wife off Florida and went to uh, Miami to visit his mother-in-law and unfortunately had an aneurysm and died at 47. And um, he was from Oregon and he and his wife had planned to return to the West Coast. And she said he would think it was a very cruel point of fate that he died in Miami. And um, she brought him out. So he, that was our first burial. So she and her mom flew out and flew him out. And uh, we've had uh, uh, people uh, bring bodies. That's the farthest, but from Portland, we have quite a few people within the state and then in Northern California who've, who've purchased plots. And moving a body around is actually not very hard to do. It's pretty easy to do. Hmm. Okay, sorry, I was just looking to see how many, um, it says how many green cemeteries are there in the US the question, um, it was an estimate of about 300. I don't know what mm -hmm. that that is. I have some other friends who are in California who purchased plots in a redwood forest somewhere. They were very excited about that. But um, but that's really interesting that you guys are the first one in Oregon. That's amazing, yeah, really. Yeah. Yes, yeah. There are um, And then Kathy says, how many... How many burials have you had so far? I think you said 11, is that what you said? 11 so far, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, then I'm curious, the how do you manage burials during the winter time with all the snow? Um, you know, we have a lot of, well, we have two snow moving equipments. We have a snow blower on our uh, tractor and we have a plow with a seven foot blade that we use for the road. So we plow the road. We shall, if you ever come up Shale City Road in the in the winter, thank us because we plowed that. Nobody else does, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we have to plow the whole road, two cars wide, and all the turnouts, or don't plow it. So if we want to go home, we do all of that. Um, so uh, we plow and we shovel. That's kind of what we've done. We we haven't done any deep deep snow. We we had a, a two and a half foot pack and buried uh, two people within a three week period. And basically we, we shovel. How frozen is the ground? I know I grew up in Minnesota and on a dairy farm and sometimes when a large animal would die in the winter, it was, you had to really get a backhoe sometimes to dig a hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not frozen down drain. Of course, it's getting warmer all the time. We've buried goats, you know, in the middle of winter too, and um, uh, you know they're human sized animals. And um, probably the first eight to eight to twelve inches are frozen, mm -hmm. and then below that, it's you know it's just cold. Okay, yeah, that sounds manageable. Um, yeah, Steve yeah. has another good question. Uh, must you allow public access in perpetuity? What if the next generation of owners want to stop? Um, there has to be public access. There has to be access for people who have either purchased a plot or have a, a family member buried there. So, um, and it's a there's a very interesting, I don't know if anybody knows much about Klamath Falls. There's a, uh, a, uh, a lawn cemetery, a regular commercial cemetery uh, in Klamath Falls that uh, uh, lost, they, he wasn't keeping up the upkeep and it happens to be um, um, a, uh, an endowment care cemetery. So endowment care cemeteries, we put 15% of every plot sale into an endowment care fund that's an irreducible fund. So it's a fund we can only draw in the interest, the interest from that. So it's a fund to um, have a principle uh, from which you can draw the interest to take care of the cemetery going forward forever and ever. Um, and so he, um, and so the, the laws are quite a bit more stringent on that, but he closed the gates and he wouldn't let anybody in. So it's, it's very illegal, um, but you don't have to allow access to the rest of the property at all. So uh, you can have a gate, you can have a fence and a gate, and you have to have posted hours that somebody could come. So whether, excuse me, I'm sorry. 
um, it could be that, you know, we're here on Wednesday afternoons from 3.30 to 4.30. Those are posted hours. And that's when you can come and we'll open the gate. But uh, you don't have to have any number of hours, but you do have to have some posted hours that people could come and come and visit. Um, so this is a kind of a tangential question, but you said you're an in holding in the monument, and I'm not sure exactly how that works. Could, um, you know, would the government buy you out? Is that an option for you? Could you make that decision or um, with the trust, is it uh, indefinitely going to be private property? Or like, Good what question. do you know? What, yeah. Good question. You know, they, they bought out a number of of in holdings, you know, willing willing sellers mm -hmm. um, who have in holdings within the, the first part of the monument. So that's an excellent question. Um, and you know, if if the if the trust that owns the land decides to be a willing seller and the, the BLM would like the land, um, uh, you know, it that's something that could happen. And obviously the cemetery would still be the cemetery whether or not people continue to be buried there it's right. still always a cemetery uh, but you could stop the burials at any time and uh, so yeah that's a very a very interesting question I suspect the Bureau of Land Management may not want to get into cemetery management um, but uh, um, we're hoping that they that they buy out a few of the uh, grazing permits outside our fence because uh, <laughs> we spend a lot of money putting up a, a very expensive fence to keep cows out because we're in open range. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. Well, I know I've been on I've been on parkland in a few different places in Minnesota and in Oregon where there have been you know old historic graves, cemetery. abandoned yeah. cemetery. I mean, they seem abandoned. Yeah. I mean, in one case, it was really quite abandoned. It was just like in the middle of what had become a forest. I'm sure it wasn't at that time, but it was public property. It was parkland. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And the one thing I wanted to say, too, is that a number of the uh, people uh, having the uh, have purchasing, what happens to a cemetery if it goes bust, basically, is that the closest municipality ends up having to take it over, especially if it's an active, has plots sold that are not filled. Um, so it's not a full cemetery. Um, but a lot of the historic cemeteries that still have room, um, uh, people are buying up and doing only green burials in those. So there are other green burial cemeteries in Oregon, but in the uh, some of the old historic cemeteries, which is nice because they're getting used again and they're getting, mm -hmm. um, uh, starting to be more taken care of. Hmm. That's um, Christine asks on the topic of fencing, have you consider it, have considerations been given towards wildlife passage? Do you guys get elk up there, for example? Uh, we do, we do. Our fences are, we have a five wire high tensile, no barbed wire. Um, and um, our grazing uh, exclusion around our wetlands uh, can't be higher than 39 inches so deer can get over. Um, and we're actually changing those uh, to, uh, we have high tensile woven wire for those, um, but we're going to change those to just straight wire. Um, so it's even easier for the animals to get through. Um, our perimeter fence is the highest uh, highest is 40 inches. It doesn't need to be very high to keep cows out. They do jump, but only when they're scared. Okay. Yeah. So we have we have lots of wildlife uh, movement. Well, that's, uh, that's kind of what we've done is really build up our uh, wildlife corridors. That's another very important piece here is that um, my picture in 50 years is that this particular piece of land is going to be a very important piece of the wildlife corridor. Uh, from the Siskiyous up to Crater Lake, basically. And uh, there are, uh, it would be wonderful if all of that was National Monument too. Um, yeah. But I think that's gonna be a really important, important thing as animals are gonna have to move up. And, you know, the turtles, people would say, oh, you can, you wouldn't breed ever, ever breed turtles, you know, about 3,500 feet. Well, we've got a whole bunch of them. Right. I know they're I know they're scheming about making a wildlife 
bridge passage over the I-5 yes. to connect with the Siskiyou Crest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That see. connectivity is. Right. Right. Yeah. It's, it's exciting. Yeah. Such a special place, really. I mean, a lovely, lovely place to be buried for sure. It really would. Colette, did you have another question? Yeah. You have to unmute. You have to unmute though. Colette, if you can hear me, you have, yeah, there you go. Yeah. My uh, hitting the space bar wasn't working. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so if we can't have plants on the graves, do, does that mean that if the birds plant, uh, if naturally gets planted, you have to remove them? No. Oh, so you could put trained birds <laughs> up there. <laughs> yes. Yes, you could. You could. You could train the birds. birds. Yeah. We also have some places that, that we're planting, you know, say elderberry, um, you know, native elderberry uh -huh. um, and you know, or some snowberry. And so if you wanted to um, pick a place and say, are you going to put snowberry someplace? Can I get buried there or have my cremated remains there? You could potentially have a plant over you. <laughs> OK, but yes, there are a lot of plants. There are a lot of plants on all those grapes. Let me assure you. I bet there they is. Are <laughs> we're grown, yes. Yep. It's um I I went up and did the turtle trot slowly with with a friend and you can walk through. It's I if you're you know if it's something you're considering, it's a nice place to go and walk and see what it's like. Um, yeah. If you're thinking of spending a lot of time there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly where it is. Uh, that I'm relatively new to the area, but um Well, if you look um are you in Ashland? No, I'm in Medford. You're in Medford. Uh, South Medford. Do you come down to Ashland? Have you? Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, Mount Ashland is the, are the big blue mountains and Grizzly Peak is the kind of, you know, open Oak Hills Mountains. So that's it's up in that. On the left. It's on the north part. part. Yeah, the, no, the north. Uh huh. Oh, to the north. Oh. Well, it's the big grassy hills, the big grassy and pine hills. Oh, yeah. OK. Sometimes the directions are confusing here because we're sort of on a diagonal. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, I'll find it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With the with the website, you can definitely get there. Yeah. yeah. Are there any we other questions? Great... Sorry, sorry, Suzanne. I say we have a great map on our website. Oh, good. It'll okay. get you right. No. Great. Um. How about? Do you have any recommendations um, about sort or or maybe can you describe a little bit what um, what the families do on their end? Do some people just work with a funeral home or people who provide green burial services or are people really taking care of their loved one kind of you know all the way through? Um, we have had we had one um, woman who had a home funeral, her family took care of her at home completely. She didn't ever go to a funeral home. Everybody else has gone to a funeral home, but um, a number of the families have taken the body or gone to the funeral home actually and dressed their loved one. And also we had one person who was um, dressed in a, a, excuse me, an elk hide, a tanned elk hide. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was beyond gorgeous. and. So a lot of working with, and there are a couple of uh, uh, funeral homes specifically that have, have really and really liked coming up here and really believe in what we're doing. And so they've been very helpful in uh, helping dress people in shrouds. So do you have to be dressed or can you, could you just be wrapped in a shroud? You could just be wrapped in a shroud. That makes more sense to me. Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, um, it's 730. And I think I think we got to all the questions. Uh, you folks have the contact. Um, let's see, I can could pop that into the chat again, if I'm on top of that, I'll do that here in just a minute. But um, I think we're done. Thank you. That's very interesting. I'm, I think this is a wonderful service. Um, I'm really yeah. happy that it's something that's available to people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And come up and visit us. I will. And, and thanks for your patience, everyone. I'm sorry we had those technical oh, difficulties. Just never know <laughs> how that's going to go. 
All right. Take care. Good night. Thank you.